Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you're here for uh, our listening session, wonderful. Uh, if you're not, uh, we're just going to be talking a little bit, uh, and you are welcome to go about your business in the background. Uh, but I'm State Senator Mark Spreitzer, and I'm here with State Representative Jenna Jacobson to uh, talk a little bit about the upcoming state budget uh, and some things that are going on at the Capitol, uh, and to listen to any of the issues that might be on your minds as it relates to state government. Uh, I'll hand over to Jenna to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. I'm Jenna Jacobson, state representative for this district, the 43rd. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and comments as we dig deep into Governor Eber's budget. So. Uh, so I've been the state senator for this area just since January. Uh, I was elected to succeed Senator Janice Ringhand, but for the past eight years I've been uh, state representative in the assembly. I live in Beloit and uh, previously covered Beloit and Western Rock County and Eastern Green County. Uh, now as a state senator, also have the chance to represent a good part of Southern Dane County, including the Oregon, Brooklyn, and Stoughton areas. And uh, so enjoy the chance to get to be here in Oregon tonight. Nope. Um, so uh, we are still in the early stages of the state budget process. Uh, there's a handout that we've prepared that has some highlights. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, it's on the table uh, up there and uh, happy to get you a copy. Um, but we're in a really good position to start out the state budget because the state has a record $7.1 billion surplus. Roughly half of that is ongoing funding that we can put toward uh, annual expenses. Uh, about the other half of that is one-time money that mostly can be spent on building projects, whether that's physical buildings or road repairs, things of that nature that are one-time use. Uh, and then about $1.7 billion has already been put into our state's rainy day fund. That happens automatically by law. Uh, Governor Evers is proposing putting another half billion into the rainy day fund on a discretionary basis. The idea here is to have money available if we were to hit harder economic times so that we wouldn't need to make budget cuts. We would just be able to tap into the rainy day fund until the economy improves. Uh, Governor Evers has put forward his budget proposal. Uh, it is now in the hands of the legislature where Republican leadership on the Joint Finance Committee will make changes to it as it goes through the process. There is a handout also on uh, hearing dates where the Joint Finance Committee will be having in-person uh, listening sessions just like we're doing here, uh, but for people from all around the state. Uh, the nearest ones to us are in Waukesha or Wisconsin Dells. Uh, if you, uh, I know some of you are local government officials, if you're able to take the day and go there and advocate for your communities, it is really worthwhile. Um, but obviously a lot of people can't take a day and travel like that. So uh, there's also information on the bottom of this handout on how to submit comments electronically. And whatever you're here to share with us tonight, we would really encourage you to also share that uh, at least through that website with members of the Joint Finance Committee um, because they are going to have a disproportionate say in what this budget eventually looks like and we want them to hear directly from you. So I think with that, uh, I'll start talking about um, the first topic on the, on the handout, which is supporting middle class families. Uh, I was really excited to see, we've, we've uh, heard Governor Evers talk about this in uh, previous conversations about the surplus and then seeing it put into the budget, I think, uh, really demonstrates the value to returning some of that money back to Wisconsinites. Uh, so the proposal is a 10% uh, tax cut for middle class families. And I, just looking at you know inflation and all the expenses that our families have, um, how that can be helpful as we're um, looking to, to the future and, and our lives and what we need. Um, additionally, it would target a tax relief for seniors, which I know um, with my role on the Village Board, hearing about how with all these costs increasing uh, ever more that our seniors are really getting squeezed, so making sure that they, they have some additional resources, um, and then uh, making sure we're taking care of our veterans as well. There's uh, also making the Child Care Counts program permanent, which was a really exciting program that came out of COVID funds that uh, supported our child care providers so that they could use those funds, whether it be to, you know, paying higher wages to their staff, um, taking care of their mortgage to offset some of their costs so that child care could continue to be affordable uh, for, for the families that are using them. Um, so making that program permanent and allowed, allotting you know, $340 million to that program, I think, is another way that not only we can support working families, but support our workforce, as we hear so many folks talking about workforce development and needing, uh, having trouble hiring, hiring the right folks. Um, there's also a proposal to have a paid fam establishing a 12-week paid family leave, um, and that could be family or medical leave. 
Um, and we know that Wisconsinites have been asking for that for a very long time. And because that, that helps that helps our families stronger, that helps people who are supporting their, fam their families as a caregiver role. Um, so I think, you know, looking at, again, looking at the, the budget and asking or, or hearing what Wisconsinites have been asking for and seeing it put into paper is a really hopeful and exciting uh, aspect. Also, um, creating a caregiver tax credit. I know I've met with folks, and Senator, I'm sure you have as well, who um, are tasked with, the, um, with taking care of their family members. And that is an expensive task, and we know that, um, that a lot of that doesn't come with reimbursement. And so uh, making sure that we're providing for those caregivers, uh, as well as the homestead credit, which would give us some property tax relief for our seniors who are on fixed incomes and low, in low income like Wisconsinites. So. I'll jump over to the back of the handout uh, talking about local government, because I know we've got at least three local government elected officials in the room. Um, we know that uh, inflation doesn't just affect families, it affects our schools, our cities, our towns, our villages, our counties. Uh, and so if we want to keep property taxes from going up and we want to be able to provide the same services that we do today, the state has to provide an increase. Uh, it just has to. Uh, so Governor Ebers has proposed reforming the shared revenue program uh, and really doing that in two ways. Um, one is uh, adjusting uh, the formula. Uh, so he's not adjusting the underlying formula, but he's kind of creating a new shared revenue program on top of existing shared revenue um, because the current formula has not been updated in a long time. Uh, and so uh, every, in addition to what you would normally expect to get, uh, Governor Evers is proposing uh, both a uh, additional distribution specifically for public safety and then an additional distribution that uh, local governments would be able to use to fund any of their needs. And he's proposing tying overall local government funding to 20% of state sales tax collection. That's key because it basically automatically indexes local government funding to inflation uh, because as prices go up over time, state sales, collect sales tax collections will also go up uh, because it's a percentage of the price of goods. Um, so uh, we have numbers for uh, specific municipalities if you're interested in them, um, but uh, municipalities within the 43rd Assembly District uh, would collectively uh, get over two and a half million additional dollars in shared revenue, uh, and um, we, uh, you know, we can get that uh, by town, village, city, uh, if you're looking for specific numbers. Governor Evers has also proposed local sales tax authority at both the uh, city and county level. Um, unfortunately, just for cities uh, over 30,000, we understand in the in the 43rd district uh, that doesn't include anybody. So uh, we would like to certainly actually see that. Uh, be more widely available, uh, but at the county level, that would still be very helpful to uh, to help our counties provide more services, and that would have to be approved by voter referendum, and then there'd be an extra half percent sales tax. Uh, there's also a proposed increase in general transportation aids and mass transit aids by 4% each year uh, to help uh, keep up with our roads and our buses, um, and then some specific targeted funding for fire and EMS. I know a lot of the rural uh, fire and EMS districts in the area are struggling and trying to figure out how to uh, pay for their needs, possibly how to hire full-time staff uh, in places that have relied in the past on volunteers, and so that's something we need a targeted investment in. Yeah, and I think we've had lots of um, conversations with folks throughout the district, specifically on that public safety piece, and as we're asking more of our governments to provide these crucial services to residents, um, we're also recognizing that that cost comes with it and with the state having this uh, surplus and in indexing our potential increases to sales tax that will um, keeping track keeping up in a, in a way that hopefully will work better than we have in the past with um, increasing costs and increasing needs um, sorry, I went off the tangent. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll talk about this next. So uh, I wanted to also hit on um, investing in Main Street businesses and our small businesses. We have been fortunate to have the Main Street Bounce Back program, which we have in our district. Over 40 um, businesses have taken advantage of, and that's really that was really exciting to read. Um, Ten here in Oregon alone. We had one in Brooklyn that um, also took advantage. So. That program has been very successful in helping our support our small businesses as they're uh, not only navigating the pandemic, but just navigating the changing realities of being in business in Wisconsin. And so um, then the investment of $50 million to keep that program moving forward, I think is really crucial to when we're talking about 
keeping Wisconsin's economy strong, helping with workforce development, helping with um, our rural communities that, um, that a lot of these uh, businesses are located in and making sure that they're, they're able to remain viable and remain in, the, um, in their communities. And then also, uh, as has been a long time, for those business owners, this has been a long time conversation, repealing the personal property tax. So that has been a conversation that's been going on for a very long time. Um, and certain you know, industries, businesses have been carved out, but we still know that there are a lot of our local businesses that are being um, taxed at these, at the, on the personal property tax and spending all this time and energy gathering that information. And it's really not providing to the municipalities a lot of revenue dollars. So um, finding a way to to remove that personal property tax, free up some of the burden to our, our local businesses, and and then fill that gap so we're not um, making a detrimental choice to our municipalities, I think is, uh, again, a really beneficial thing that we're seeing in the budget for our businesses. Uh, Health care is another topic that we certainly hear a lot about. Uh, Governor Evers is once again proposing taking the uh, federal Medicaid expansion dollars to expand Badger Care, uh, which would both cover nearly 90,000 more Wisconsinites with health insurance and also save $1.6 billion in additional federal investment that we could then invest back into other health care programs. Uh, he's also proposed making 2023 the year of mental health. And that includes uh, both a $500 million uh, investment to access uh, mental and behavioral health care, uh, as well as some additional targeted investments in mental health access through our schools. Um, and then there are several programs aimed at women who are pregnant or uh, who've become mothers uh, wanting to uh, reduce uh, maternal and infant mortality through uh, prevention, as well as a newborn screening program. And really critically, uh, something that does seem to finally have bipartisan support, extending Medicaid coverage postpartum for a full year uh, so that both a mother and the child can get the health care coverage that they need. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, housing affordability and uh, also included in the governor's budget is establishing um, an affordable workforce housing grant program. Uh, this would um, help us develop and maintain uh, affordable housing because as we know, it's not just quantity, but having quality housing for, for our community members. Uh, there's also um, a proposal in there to $100 million in grants that would help municipalities with renovation and restoration and blighted residents, um, as well as low interest and forgivable loans to low to moderate income folks so that they can renovate and repair their homes, hopefully uh, with the idea that they can stay in their homes longer um, and still have that quality, affordable housing, and we're not forcing people to move out of their, their beloved neighborhoods, their beloved communities, um, but still being able to have the housing that they need. Um, there's also uh, an increase in annual tax credits for WIDA. They're more, the proposal is to more than double what those tax credits would be from $42 million to $100 million, which would be an incredible boon to our, um, our housing tax credit program. And then expanding renter protections. So a few years ago, there were some renter protections that were um, uh, removed by state law, and um, I think making sure that we're protecting renters in an environment where um, there's such low stock for renters that uh, they don't really maybe have as powerful of a voice as they, uh, they could. So making sure that we have some protections in place for those folks. Um, and then the thing that stick, stuck out to me, we just talked about this last night in the uh, village board as well, was water utility assistance programs. I know a lot of communities are going through the process of reanalyzing their water utility um, bills, making sure they're doing, they have a rate case, or building a rate case so that they're charging appropriately, but the net effect of that can be that your water utility bill will go up. So expanding our water utility assistance programs to make sure that um, low income folks have access to, um, to, to assistance with their bills, make sure that people on a fixed income hopefully have some of that impact minimized is uh, again something that we've been hearing about in the district, uh, make, making sure that we're providing that support for folks. We could talk all night. There's a million things in the budget. I think we'll each just hit on one more topic because then we really do want to open it up and, and hear from all of you. Yeah. Um, so uh, on family farms and rural communities, uh, there's uh, $750 million for broadband expansion. We've been seeing a lot of federal dollars coming into Wisconsin lately, which has really moved the needle on broadband after many years of pretty slow efforts. The goal of this $750 million is to 
really get 100% of Wisconsinites connected. Uh, the estimate is that it will cost between that and a billion dollars to fill in those final remaining gaps once the federal dollars that are coming down get spent. We want to ensure 100% access, and the hope is that this could be enough money to do that. Um, there's also some specific financial assistance to help people uh, actually get connected, because so often we get calls saying, the, they ran it down my road, but they didn't connect it to my house, and they want X thousand of dollars to do that. We've got to actually get people connected. Um, there's also some funding here for some uh, agricultural initiatives that I'm pretty excited about to partner with farmers to improve our water quality. Our producer-led watershed protection grant program has been wildly successful. Uh, these are uh, farmer-led groups in specific river watersheds. We've got groups for the Rock River, the Sugar River, the Yahara River, uh, and they are working together to promote cover crops and buffers and no-till practices and other things where farmers talk to farmers and really figure out how to protect water quality and just a little bit of state investment helps these groups get together and supports their work. Um, and then there are also some initiatives here aimed at getting healthy food grown by Wisconsin farmers into the hands of hungry people, uh, both through the Food Security Initiative, which partners with food banks, uh, and by expanding access through our food share program for people in that program to be able to buy directly from farmers at things like farmers markets uh, that aren't always otherwise able to process that form of payment. And then also for our public schools, I know that's a, another large topic for folks. Um, increasing the funding to public schools, uh, $2.6 billion, which, uh, as we know, uh, we've been hearing, we've had so many schools in our district going to referendum um, because they need additional funding, um, considering going to referendum. So I think that $2.6 billion going around the state would be extremely helpful. That's a, there's, it's broken out into a couple different categories. We have a billion dollars, just generally speaking, in um, uh, additional funding to the state's general equalization formula to schools, um, and then another billion dollars for special education, because one of the things that we know is that when we're not fully funding special education, it's those general purpose dollars that are getting um, pulled away from, from the um, traditional learning paths to help support special education, when we know that all students should be deserving of having a, a good education. So making sure that we're funding the special education programs and our traditional track education programs, I think, is a great thing to see in this budget and um, really mirrors what we've been hearing around, around the district. Um, additionally, we have about uh, $270 million to ensure that kids have access to mental health care. Mark had mentioned that earlier. Um, the year of mental health, we've been hearing about our, our students who are in need of that, that specific type of support. So making sure that, that we're funding that so we can provide it. Um, additionally, uh, fully funding school breakfasts and lunches. So a lot of people may or may not know that during the pandemic with the federal dollars that we received, we were, schools were able to provide um, lunches at no cost for students and making those programs permanent because we know students learn better when they're able to eat. Um, and then breakfast as well, um, not just lunches. So I think that, you know, again, when we're looking at supporting kids to make sure that they have what they need to not only receive the information in schools, but absorb it and have it stick with them. Um, and then finally, uh, additional funds uh, for financial literacy programs. Uh, the, the Oregon School District, for example, just implemented a half credit financial literacy uh, class for graduation. There's bills ta being taught at, or talked about at the state level to make that a statewide requirement. But we all know that financial literacy is so important for our kiddos and it's uh, not consistent around the state if they're getting that that information um, and uh, how it's being taught. And as somebody who has worked with adults throughout my career, after they've gotten themselves into a financial pickle, I'm so excited to see that we're working on the front end to help prevent some of those things uh, before, they, before they happen. So, so with that, uh, we want to open it up and uh, we're happy to, to listen or answer questions about whatever it is that you all would like to talk about. Yeah. Marilyn. Well, was there anything in the budget for the study of more high-speed rail that we've talked about? Is there anything in transportation about that? Um, two, uh, is there anything that um, is mentioned in the education portion that, so we've got public education, so I'm hoping that we won't have to play the power game and give more to um, 
choice schools, but I don't know if there's been conversation about that. So those are two things. So you can repeat the question. Do you want to take the rail and sure. do this education? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm not sure uh, specifically on high speed rail. I uh, I'm looking at my staff in case they know off the top of their heads, but I. Um, we'd have to check into that. Happy to get back to you. Uh, I certainly support high-speed rail. Um, I remember when Governor Walker uh, obviously turned away uh, a high-speed rail effort that uh, that I wish would have gone forward. And um, I think it's you know we're going to need federal partnership to make this happen. But uh, we need uh, the state government ready to act. And I know Governor Evers would be if we can make this happen. But whether there's something specific in the budget proposal, I'd have to look into and get back to you. There's definitely, um, we're getting a lot of federal money that is going to be flowing to Wisconsin through the bipartisan infrastructure law as well as the, um, uh, as well as the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And so I do know that DOT has, for instance, a plan to build out uh, high-speed charging stations for electric vehicles. There is part of that in the budget, but we'll check on the high-speed rail. Um, and then for your second question, as far as, uh, it was school vouchers. That's what your yeah. question was? Yeah, in regards to education. So um, there is not uh, an expansion of, of the voucher programs in the yeah. in the budget um, and kind of a status quo as far as where that program is at. First of all, I'd like to put a pitch in for the shared revenue form because as a town official, uh, we've been led dry over the last 10, 20 years uh, with the limited increases in our assessed value that we're allowed to translate into property um, but I'll ask you a couple of uh, annoying questions. Um, first one is, uh, if there is any move to allow local municipalities to provide internet service, it's specifically excluded by statute and it ties our hands when it comes to trying to provide higher speed broadband for our residents. Um, of that, I realize that uh, telecommunication companies are very much not in favor of that but they've really fallen down on their responsibilities to extend high-speed internet to our residents and as such, this would be one way that we could do it and probably do it better than that. So I'll leave you with that one. And I'm going to give you a real, a bit of a hardball, but I realize this is a democratic uh, governor's budget and I also realize it's somewhat dead on arrival. Uh, so I'm just curious, if you two were Republicans, what would you be telling your constituents at a meeting like this? I'll start with the second one. I think that, for me, it would be a really hard one to answer just because um, I make a lot of my decisions based on the values that I was instilled in growing up. My mother's right there, so she can tell you. So it's like... What of any of this do you think you, as a Republican senator, would theoretically support and include? Yeah, so again, I go back to like how we make our decisions, right? right? And I, it's hard, you know, I imagine that a Republican senator would say some, something similar as far as they're you, basing it on their values. So I think of, you know, in my values, it's what's going to support all Wisconsinites, what is going to uplift those who don't have access to the resources that I do, um, or that most of Wisconsinites do, what is going to provide for, what is going to lay the groundwork for folks so that they can provide for themselves, right? So when we talk about transportation, I'm thinking, well, we have to have good roads if you, you know, if you want to get to and from work, if you want to start a business, if you want to do, you know, insert whatever your hopes and dreams are, what, what is that infrastructure that you need? And so that's kind of what I'm looking at. I can't really speak to what I would, I would assume that a Republican would have a similar value system as far as like, what do, what are they hearing from their constituents? But I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, are there discussions outside of joint finance that are started to look at things that could potentially be bipartisan or any 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 areas of agreement? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that's yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think there's uh, the the optimistic part of me would say I think we get somewhere in the middle on on a lot of this. You know, I, I think. Some of the surplus probably goes unspent because we don't agree how to spend it. Um, I think a lot of the proposed increases end up being smaller than what Governor Evers is proposing. Um, and some of the things like the Medicaid expansion is not going to happen. The legalization of marijuana is not going to happen. 
Um, you know, there, there's a few things in here that obviously have been proposed before, and Republicans have taken them out every time, and I don't think that will be different. Um, but uh, I mentioned the, um, uh, uh, which one was it? Um, uh, well, one thing, that, that uh, tax credit at WIDA that, that Jenna was talking about, Republicans actually put forward a bill to do the exact same thing. Um, you know, it becomes a credit thing of, you know, they're going to say it was their idea. Who cares? Uh, you know, it might actually happen. Um, some of the uh, agricultural things I talked about, uh, the, the producer-led watershed program has had pretty good bipartisan support. Uh, the postpartum uh, Medicaid coverage, uh, we, we got Republicans to think about going from 60 days to 90 days last time. Now there actually is a Republican uh, bill to go to a year. Whether we'll get it done or not, I don't know, but at least some of them are on the record uh, saying that they support that. Um, you know, I think uh, they understand they've got to do something on shared revenue, something on public schools, uh, and, you know, probably something on broadband, uh, whether it's exactly what we're asking for, you know, probably not, but they're going to basically strip out everything Governor Evers proposed and then start adding things back in and taking credit as they do. And as long as we get to something that moves the needle forward, uh, you know, it, as with the past two budgets, it won't look like what he proposed, but if Governor Evers feels like it ends up helping the state, he's going to sign it, and I think that's where we probably land. concerns I have on broadband is, uh, and I'm a town chair, is all the ISPs want the municipalities to give money to help. And I don't have any money to give. And that makes it really difficult. I mean, I either got to raise taxes, take a bond out, or pass up an opportunity. And my biggest concern is by the time I save that money and my reserves skim off a little top every year, and it'll be five, six years down the road, money will be all gone, and I'm going to be left with no broadband. Um, and I, I got, I, I, I got I, I had discussions with major ISPs about, I have no money, guys. You can go for a grant. I can help you. I can get the support. I can, you know, talk it up in my town. That's what I can do for you. And they say, see ya. I'm going to go somewhere else. And I'm not sure where these municipalities are getting this money, but it is a big concern when you have no money to give, and my last dollar goes into public safety or roads. Is there anything that the uh, legislation can do to help us with that? Of, hey, ISPs, you should not be asking the municipalities for money. We got all this money flowing in, and yet you still want us to come up with. The latest one I had was seven hundred thousand dollars. Oh my God, that's my almost my whole year budget. I could try to back them down, and he's like, "We'll come back around the next time." So there's a difference in how the state grant program has worked compared to how some of the federal dollars recently have worked, and I think that has made some of the federal dollars work better. Um, the state program is based on competitive, uh, self-initiated applications where you and an ISP basically have to partner and go apply, and you're competing against everybody else. And even though it's not written down anywhere, it's sort of come to be standard that there needs to be about a 50% match uh, from you know to, to have a competitive application. Now, the ISP could provide that whole match, but if they don't want to, then they're coming to you. Um, and, if, and you don't have much choice because they can just go and apply with some other community if that community is able to offer it. The federal dollars have instead basically said, here's the area that needs service, and we're going to take bids from internet providers on who can serve that area, and somebody's going to come in and want the money. Uh, and so I think that has gotten it pushed out a little bit faster, but we're still ending up with gaps. And so I think we are going to have to tweak the state program, because as we get down to places that for whatever reason, have not yet had a successful grant application, there's a reason for that. Either it's harder to serve geographically, more sparsely rural, or you don't have the matching funds. And so we need to at some point say, if it's the state's mission to have 100% service, and we know who's not yet served, then, then we've got to kind of look like the federal model and say, okay, town of Brooklyn needs service, who's going to get it to them? Just on that note, though, I'll tell you, you know, um, Major ISPs have received millions of dollars in federal funding, and yet what we see is they come back and offer to connect an additional five houses 
plus an area that already has excellent internet coverage. So, and I realize that's a federal issue, but that is a, a major thing for us is the CAP and CAP2 funding that uh, went into all of these ISPs was not allocated very well. Yeah. Tim. So, what can we help uh, help you do to support your efforts? Good. Um, I know it probably sounds repetitive, but being here, coming to these helps, going to the joint finance meetings, there's the, the list um, on the back table of, of all those that are around the state, going to those really helps because the joint finance committee, it's, you know, it's a bipartisan committee, and so you will be able to get in front of those decision makers, those Republican decision makers and Democrats to um, uh, speak to that. There's the online form if you can't, tr can't or don't want to travel. Um, and I think also just the more we talk about this, um, I know it sounds probably like a minimalist approach, but the more we talk about this, the, uh, the louder that becomes collectively. You know, some of these issues that we're talking about, the postpartum, for example, expansion of uh, postpartum coverage, it started out as, no, we're not going to expand that. And then it was, you know, we're going to expand it a little, we're willing to talk about doing it a little bit. And now, now we're up to a full year. And that's because more and more folks are talking about how this is a necessary, necessary expansion, how people need this in order to, you know, further our stated goal of supporting uh, families, supporting infants. And so, um, again, it, it sounds pretty minimalistic, but those conversations, they really do percolate to the top. So having, you know, I know um, the uh, city of Stoughton has passed a uh, resolution about shared revenue. Um, also, if any one of the city council members wants to contact us, you know, the more folks that are getting involved in this and, and speaking to the, the parts of this budget that they like, the more chance that, you know, even if it doesn't last, last in the budget, as Mark had mentioned, it could become a standalone bill that we could get bipartisan support and get through. So that would be my suggestion. And numbers matter, uh, you know, and personal stories matter for sure, but when it comes to something like the online comments, I mean, there's no reason that every city council member, every town board member in your community shouldn't fill out that form and, and echo the same thing so that when some staff person is adding up and saying, wow, we had, you know, 2,000 people who said we need shared revenue or whatever the issue is, um, you know, at, at some point I imagine that kind of uh, counting how many people contacted about different things is going to happen and and so you know if there's a really compelling story to tell tell it but otherwise just getting 50 people to all say no I want this same thing I think can matter yeah, yeah. that's why we've got uh, a petition back there on the on the child care counts issue specifically because um, we know that uh, child care providers desperately need that money to continue. It's, it's critical for our economy. And so we're actively collecting petition signatures on that specific issue because if, you know, we, there's so many things in the budget, but if, if we come in with a stack and say, you know, here's how many thousands of people across the state said they want this child care money to continue, maybe that will be one thing that otherwise wouldn't have survived contact with joint finance that will because of that people sharing their voices. This is not maybe directly related to this year's budget, but perhaps it could be. Um, our long bedraggled school finance funding formula and maybe reworking that would help us with the finance and the budgeting of schools. That's no new thing. But it just drops off the world every every time because people don't. It takes work. It takes cooperation. And working on that, even if it's a standalone bill at some other time. But really, really, this needs to be made a more fair and equitable formula throughout the state. Yeah, so um, comment on the school funding formula and, and revisiting that and making appropriate adjustments so that there, it's a more equitable throughout the state. Yeah, I think that's absolutely something. Uh, I think it's, but not the way the budget's set up now. But fixing it the way it is now is 
Well, yeah, it speaks to, you know, we, maybe we wouldn't be needing to infuse, you know, almost $3 billion in cash into our school system if we had adjust, adjusted our funding previously. Yeah, no, and this is, I mean, this doesn't matter your school size. Our, our rural schools, our urban schools, our suburban schools are all uh, in the same boat as far as that formula is no longer serving the way we had hoped it would. And, you know, we should be talking about what, what we need it to be doing and how we can adjust it. And so I think that while that's not specifically in the budget, it speaks to this greater conversation of how are we providing the services that Wisconsinites are asking us to provide. Well, we're happy to hang out for a minute if there's anything one-on-one -on -one you want to talk about. And, uh, you know, please, uh, our contact information is on the back of the handout. So if you get home and say, gee, I forgot to mention this, give us an email, give us a call, and yeah. we'll be there. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.